risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Today the church celebrates the memory of the myrrh bearing women, Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, and John the Evangelist, the Apostle. But the Sunday is called Myrrhbearers Sunday, which is really nice that it falls on Mother's Day. Just there's a little like, connection. These holy women were faithful disciples of Christ. Always remain near the Lord in his earthly service. They listened to his preaching in the Galilean synagogues. They walked with him to Jerusalem, were present at the resurrection of Lazarus. They cried with the mother of God at the foot of the cross. They followed Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb. They spent hours following the crucifixion in pain and agony. Hours in pain and agony with what was left of the Lord's disciples. Undoubtedly, their hearts burnt with the desire to run to the Lord, but they observed the Sabbath. They rested. Actually, they didn't really rest much on the Sabbath, I don't think, but they observed the Sabbath. There was that Sabbath was a high day when Jesus had been crucified, and they went into the stillness of the Saturday. And when that stillness came to an end, that Saturday, the Lord is in the tomb. A little bit of action today. <laughs> That's fine. But when the great stillness came to an end that Saturday, the first rays of the rising sun, having gathered all that was necessary for burial, the holy women hurried to him, whom alone their hearts desired, their beloved teacher. Did they already believe in the resurrection of the Savior? You know, did they remember the sermons? Did they recall the great entrance into Jerusalem that just happened for them? We're two weeks from Pascha, but these accounts are just right, you know, they're Pascha accounts. We're like zipped back two weeks, you know? So this is the, the, the glorious third day. What were they recalling as they went? We don't know. We don't know. Did they recall the raising of Lazarus that had just happened? We don't know. But any hope for a miracle was also had to be like with the burden of knowing what had happened to the Savior and how he was. That he had been, you know, midnight trial, you know, and spit upon and beaten up and had been mocked, you know, and then crucified and then taken down from the cross and buried in this tomb. And they had that in mind for sure. Did they have to, were they able to like recall these other res like resurrections that Jesus had done, the three? I don't know. Grief may have just overwhelmed them. So they were just going to the tomb. And they walked to the tomb with burial clothes, not with banners, not with like victory. They did go to the tomb with all those aloes and spices and all that to prepare, to kind of finish the job preparing Jesus, um, who they, they went to prepare a dead man. That's what they went to do. Did they know the fullness of everything? Probably not, but we don't fully know. We most certainly know they did not go to meet the risen Lord. That would have just been beyond them, to run into him. Their sorrow was so great that when they saw the tomb wide open, they did not know what had happened. It's not like they walked up, they're like, oh, this is good. You know, they walked up saying, what? They even run into him and mistake him to be like a cemetery gardener. They're so overcome. The faithfulness of the holy myrrh-bearing women to the Lord is so great that they walk to him in the dark, Early that first day, despite the guards who had been ordered to keep the tomb sealed, you know, it's a big deal to think, well, we're going to go like face down a few Roman guards. I, I'm sure that they never had ever thought they would ever do that. 
and they're doing it. Despite the large stone which lay in their way to the teacher, really despite all odds, they were going. Despite all odds, they were going to go to the tomb with all those burial spices. And I have in mind that it's a little bit of the picture of, a, of our spiritual life. Like, despite all odds, we just go to the Lord. No matter what, we're just going. <laughs> the faithfulness of these holy women become the apostles to the apostles. They bring the good news of the resurrection. Even before the evangelists had picked up a pen, even before they had gone on any kind of missionary journeys, before any of that happened, the women go to them and proclaim the good news. It's incredible. It's really the first sermon. It's the first gospel, good newsy thing that happens when the women go to the men and say, Tomb's empty. How often in our lives we can't seem to access our faith when we go through illness or inconvenience or suffering or sorrow. At times it feels like there is a large stone in the way blocking us from seeing the risen Lord. At times, it seems, oh. at times, it seems that it's difficult to hear the Lord. At times, it feels like it's, it's difficult to feel close to God, even if we want to. I mean, everybody goes through this. All of us. Wanting to feel close to God, and somehow it doesn't like connect up for us at times. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes it's just impossible, it feels like. We could ask the question, who will roll the stone from the tomb for us? St. Ignatius Branchaninov said in a reflection about this gospel passage, the tomb is our heart. I really love this. You know, he takes the gospel and then he like kind of returns it around for us. The tomb is our heart. The heart was once a temple, but it became a tomb. Christ enters it by means of the sacrament of baptism in order to dwell there, to work in us. The heart is consecrated as a temple to God. But now we know that sometimes, through unrepentant sins, we have, you know, whatever, whatever's going on, whatever we brought back in, that heart can wind up becoming like a musty, dark tomb type of place again. It's not like Christ entered it and then it's just from now on, you know, there's a, as we've talked about, like a battle in the heart between that presence of Christ there and then what we introduce that has nothing to do with him there. A deadening of spiritual feeling can come in and we feel distant from God. The fathers call this insensibility. Insensibility. Insensibility is that deadening of spiritual feeling. It's the unseen death of the human soul with respect to spiritual things. You know, maybe you've felt this as well. You know, I think we've all gone through this. Where we want to feel spiritual things and can't. The fathers have a word for it. Insensibility. We want to feel and even have respect for spiritual things. But our life is flourishing with respect to material things. We have a long-term slackness of life with lots of distractions, voluntary sins, forgetfulness of God in eternity, inattention or even superficial attention to the gospel. It's just hard. Spiritual life. We want to read the gospel and get it. Maybe we read the gospel and don't get it or even don't read the gospel. You know, we want to pray. We pray and it's just not happening somehow. Or we kind of start to forget to pray. Spiritual inattention. You can think of it like having like a long physical illness and how that like breaks down the body and like wears us down. It's like that spiritually. It's just like that. It's just like goes on a long time and it becomes really hard. But today, if you will hearken to his voice and confess your sins, you will hear the good news. What is the good news? There's a lot that can be said here, but I won't say everything. The holy murmurers bring the good news at the first ray of the sun. They run to the Lord, and what do they see? They see they're too late. 
They're too late for tears, too late for burial ointments. The tomb is empty. They went there to do a job and they got there too late. It's really good news. And even more good news. Unlike the prodigal son, that parable where the father runs out to meet the son kind of halfway as the son's returning. Son's made his all way back from a foreign land, and the father comes running to him and meets him at the gate or whatever, however that goes, that parable we love so much. With this, the Lord has actually just done everything. There's no running halfway to meet us. He actually went, he did all of the work. What could not be done, breaking the bonds of hell, defeating death, and he even goes ahead of all of them to Galilee. And what did the angels say? Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a long white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, don't be amazed. You see Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's not here. See the place where they laid him, and go tell his disciples. And Peter. That he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Leah read the epistle, which they actually will take in all the, the good news for them, the message. Not only did we get told anything, not only did we see anything, we've touched him. They go all the way. Like, it's an incredible, like, witness to the gospel. Jesus is not risen by, like, rumor. <laughs> Jesus is not risen by, like, some account. Even if it's verified. Jesus is risen, and we have seen him, and we have touched him. It's incredible. <coughs> I told you there are two things to the good news. This one about the myrrh-bearing women being laid, and the angel saying, go tell the disciples and Peter. That second part harkens back to last Sunday for me, which harkens back to the lost sheep. Thomas, I said, I made the argument last week that Thomas is the lost sheep. The Lord had 99, you know? And Thomas wasn't with them when the Lord rose from the dead and showed up with all the other disciples, the other ten. Because Judas is already gone. He's killed himself. So the ten are in the upper room. Thomas isn't there. He says, unless I see him and I touch him, I won't believe. What does Jesus do? Okay. That's, that's okay for me. I can go back for that. I can show up for that. That's what it'll take. I'll come back around for you. What happens here? The first proclamation of the, God, of the good news of the resurrection of Christ, what happens? Go tell the disciples, and also, you've got to tell the guy who is my right-hand man, who denied me three times, you've got to tell him, you've got to make sure to tell him, you've got to make sure Peter gets this. He's gone back for Peter. You know, he went back for Thomas. He went back to the lost sheep in the parable. He went back for Thomas, and he goes back for Peter. Make sure Peter knows. Tell all the disciples. Got to tell the one who fell the hardest. I'm coming back for him. You are the lost sheep. I mean, this is the gospel message. No matter what we've done, no matter the insensibility we feel, wanting to break through and pray and summing, somehow through our own sin and we need to confess, and the Lord's coming back for us. He swings back around for us. And where they made, those apostles and disciples made that proclamation, we have seen him, we have touched him. Something will happen this morning beyond that. I mean, the miracle of miracles, you will consume him. I mean, we should, we should be walking around looking for miracles everywhere, given what happens here. The Holy Spirit will come down on all of us and on the gifts on the altar. It's Pentecost. We haven't even got 50 days done. We're already at Pentecost every Sunday. You know? And what will happen? You'll come forward. The Orthodox will come forward and consume him. He'll enter into all our joints and reins, organs, body parts, blood. I mean, you're not going to leave here the same person you came in as. That's good news. <laughs> that is good news. You've not been forgotten. You have not been forgotten. 
It's later than you think, as Father Stephen Rose said, but it's not too late to surrender your life to the King. It's not too late to confess your sins. It's not too late to give our hearts over again and again to the Lord. It's just not too late. Today's the day. Arise, O sleeper. Let us rise up. He will have to roll the stone away from our hearts. Insensitive, insensibility is too tough for us. So ask him to help. Ask him to roll it away. Arise, O sleeper, at first light and run to our sweetest Lord Jesus. He's waiting for us. In Galilee, we have to a little bit of a spiritual journey. We have to go a little bit. But he's waiting for us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen.